The Cambria is the last big coasting barge in Europe still working under sail alone. She's 91 feet long with 5,000 feet of canvas. She can carry 175 tons dead weight and with conditions in her favor has been known to pass a nine knot motor ship. I've neither gold nor I've neither crown but I'll sail the ocean all round and round I'll sail the ocean until I die I don't care where my poor body lies Bob Roberts, skipper of the Cambria, has never served in a ship with an engine. Great bird! Sailing means everything to him, and so does the River Orwell. Whether he's been carrying timber to Southampton, cattle cake to Colchester, pulp, coal, cement, wheat, or what you will to where it's wanted, he revels in his ability to harness the elements to achieve his destination. One of the fascinations of this job, you know, of having a sailing barge, is that we have to do exactly the same things as we did hundreds of years ago. I mean, when Nelson brought ships in and out of it, I mean, he just had to do what we do. We had to do what he did. So you're doing the, you're carrying out a tradition that's gone on for centuries and centuries. How much longer, I don't know. I'm getting old, so is the old barge. But anyway, when we leave Harry, you see, we often go out with the Medusa Channel. Half of people don't know why it's called the Medusa Channel, but it's because Nelson was in a ship named the Medusa. And the pilots refused to, the risk of taking him out to sea when there was a southeast gale blowing, or half a gale of wind, which is a bad enough there. He said he was going to get out, but he wasn't a man you could stop in a hurry. So, the pilots refused to take him out. He got all of a surveyor from Ipswich. He said, you made a chart of here. Is there water out? What we now call the Medusa Channel over the stone banks past the knees. He said, there is water. Right, he said, come aboard my ship. And you come aboard my ship from Nelson means you were going aboard anyway, even if you didn't get home for two years. So uh, out she went, you see, on the port tack, made this channel with a lead line going. The Medusa got out. And she was the first ship in that sort of weather to ever use that channel. So I always think, well, that's Nelson's channel. When I use it, uh, you know, the old boy did me a good turn, really. It takes so long to learn barging and sailing and seamanship that it seems silly to give it up. I mean, uh, all right, give it up just when you can't get your leg over the rail. But uh, otherwise, I don't see any sense in giving up. I mean, if I wasn't barging, what should I do? I've been offered command of motor ships. All you do is stand there going boom, 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 from Christmas to Christmas, watching the red go up and down. Oh, and what becomes of you? There's a radio telephone at the back. There's some clerk in the office telling him to hurry up. Some clerk has never been to sea, probably. I mean, I don't want that sort of life. Well, this cargo we've loaded, there's 1,300 bags of cattle cake. It's come from Africa. Um, this is the sort of thing which is brought here in traditional cargo ships in Tilbury Dock. The ships can't get to the smaller ports, so we take it out of them and take it to places like Colchester, you know. It's a very valuable cargo, and uh, the cost of a bag of this is uh, as much as a farmer can afford, but when pasture's bad, it's what he puts in with his feed to feed the cattle so you get milk and beef. So you feel you're really doing an important job. You're taking the stuff to the place where it's wanted. In the dock, the only disadvantage we've got as a sailing vessel over motor vessels is that we have to employ a tug sometimes to pull us into the berth or pull us into the dock or out of the dock or something like that. Apart from that, it doesn't make any difference. If you're going to spend several thousand pounds, you don't order it today and want it tomorrow. This has been bought in Africa months and months ago. If we took a fortnight to get to culture, it wouldn't make much difference. So it isn't a question of time. You don't work by time, you work by the tide, by the season, by the wind. Because that's your life. If there's a fresh wind northeast, you're very anxious to get a freight done, you might be broke. 
there's a fresh wind north east, you say, all right, well, down goes that anchor. Or you tie up on a buoy and, and hang on till it eases all for the wind shifts. There's just the two of you and the dog. You've got to get there with the aid of the wind and the sun and the tide and a prayer or two. You, you can't uh, compare this with road transport or shore transport or air transport. Air transport too dear, too little of it. Road transport clutters up the roads. You don't get it all at once. Rail transport railway where you never find it. It'll be up some bloody stockyard somewhere, wouldn't it? Once it's in this barge, they've got their cargo in the barge they've chartered. Naturally, we get there as soon as we can because we don't get paid until we do. They know that. Come on then, Penny. Another one. Come on. I started sailing when I was a, a boy in a little old fishing boat at the pool. Because they were all sailed then, there were no motors in them. And, uh, the fishermen used to look after the trawl, I used to have to look after the boat. But uh, after that I went in an old bar canteen, named the Water Witch, and then schooners and barges, until of course under sail there's only barges left. So they're the only things you can sail. And it takes years and years to learn how to sail properly. When I say sail, I mean they know all the jobs, inside and out, winter and summer, dark and daylight, all sorts of harbours and pier heads to take. And you don't learn that in five minutes or a few weekends. Well, I wasn't born in Suffolk, I was born in Dorset. The Suffolk parents, you see, is a rum sort of mixture. I used to sing in the choir. And uh, then they transferred you to a big minster down in Dorset, in a place called Wimborne, Wimborne Minster. And you, from there you could get what they called a chorister's scholarship to a grammar school then. Of course my mother didn't want me to go to sea, but uh, all her family had been to sea and all her family were fishermen around Kessingland and Lower Staff, see. And uh, my grandfather had been to sea in the Great Eastern. Talk was always about the sea and you get caught up in it. I was 15 when I first went to sea, just coming up 16. And uh, the first job I ever had was to, to peel 172 taters, I remember. I thought I was never going to win. And then the skipper had bought 400 eggs cheap. And he said, now, if you cover them with grease and stack them away, he said, they'll keep. See, you covering with tallow. I got sick of this, you know, I'd done about 30 eggs, you know, smarring them up with grease. I thought, now, if I melted that grease and dipped them in it, see, how much quicker that would be. So I melted the tallow and dipped the eggs in, popped them in there. I'd done them in no time, so I got rid of that job. Because uh, I think it was about a couple of months later we started on the eggs, you see. <laughs> when, they cook, when they cook them, I was trying to break them in the frying pan. <laughs> <laughs> just a little purple hard ball in the middle that's supposed to be a yolk because it's hot fat to cook them all. <laughs> They've been cooked about two months. <laughs> you learn, you're learning all the time. You're learning the ship's movements, how long it takes and so on. Set your tops, old dick. Right on. So uh, after that, of course, you're allowed to go aloft and of the square canvas and that sort of thing. I used to like doing that because you always like climbing, you see, when you're kids, don't you? You just scamper about it, the boys always had that job a lot. Well, when I got into barges, you know, barges like the Cambria, it was something the same job, you know, the same attitude to life, and you taught the same things, although you worked a slightly different way. A barge is quicker, it's faster, she's better to wind it. It's a marvellous craft, I mean, the there's no craft in the world to beat the Thames barge, what we call a spready barge. What other vessel would you have to take, well, as we do, 175 tons, and what's Dickie's 18, isn't he? 
And I'm an old man and this dog, and we're the crew. You know, there's 5,000 square feet of canvas. Well, what other vessel in the world ever does that? So barges always attracted me, and I always think, even now, I, I think they're the finest sailing vessels ever invented. Nothing to beat them. It's impossible to say what makes a good barge, because that's something inside him. It's not anything uh, you can say, he's this or he's that. I think it's just an appreciation of what's happening all around him. Some people, I mean, are good at doing one thing, but a bargeman's got to be able to do everything, isn't he? He's got to be able to cook, he's got to be able to paint, he's got to be a bit of a carpenter and shipwright, he's got to be a bit of a sailmaker, he's got to be a sailor. There, boy, Dick. You know, you've got to be all sorts of things. All right, top's are loose. A lot of people look upon barging as a, as a hard load, you know. Because if you've never done any work, threading the needle's hard, isn't it? But uh, if you've always worked hard, if you've always been in sailing vessels, it, it doesn't seem hard. See, what seem, people see us pulling topsails up and even the anchor up, and they say, blimey, that must be hard work. But I mean, if you've always had hard work, you don't take any notice of it. There's a community of you at sea, and you all get to know each other on the coast. A lot of you are related. Consequently, you feel part of um, a tribe, you might say. They go to sea in small ships. A is for the anchor we carry on the bow. B is for the bowsprit that we lower down. C is for the cat head where the anchor is stowed. D is for the day, it's where our boat is home. So merrily, so merrily, so merrily are we. There's none so blithe as a bargeman at sea. Sing high, sing low, a sailing along. Give an old barge a breeze and you cannot go wrong. Because I haven't always just traded round barge ports. I mean, we, we used to trade across to the continent. And then in the days of the Great, great Depression, as the Americans called it, uh, we were all out of work, two million unemployed and so on. Ships full of, rivers full of laid up ships. I had enough money to get a small boat and two of us set off in a 27 foot boat. Sailed down to the Canaries, picked up the trades ran across to South America, the West Indies, through the Panama Canal, but we lost her in the Pacific on an island there through trying to help somebody else. Another time I sailed across the South Atlantic, went across the equator and ran the South Atlantic to Rio with a little catch. It was under sail again, you see, never any motors. But uh, most of my voyages have been coastal and continental voyages. And it's nice sometimes to go back and find some old faces there you met years ago when you sailed into these places. When you get there, and the voyage is successfully accomplished, you've made the pier ends and entered the harbour. When you get there and take the hatches off, there's the dockers there and there's the merchant there and all the brains, you know. And uh, you say, well, all right, there's Chicago. It's quite all right, nothing wrong with it. You're in. They don't understand what we've done, and we don't tell them either. But uh, there's a great satisfaction in having done it. And you see this cargo going out, and you know, well, we brought that, you know, and it's doing some good. And when we unload it here, some of these lorries go direct to the farms, and some of them, of course, take it to a store from where it is distributed. Biggest colours is the immense amount of money involved, which a lot of people don't seem to appreciate. They think we go sailing about like a yacht, you know. But uh, when you consider you get a heavy insurance, you've got to insure the cargo, you've got to insure the ship, you've even got to insure the mate. You know? And all this mounts up 
I've got to make about £12 a week before I get a halfpenny for myself. The bar's got to earn that before I pay the expenses of a week. Yeah. And then if I make £13, a pound of it's mine. You might make nothing, you might make a last one year and make a little profit the next. You chance that, I mean, that's where you've got to use your own ingenuity and rely on yourself. When we're unloaded, being a narrow place, we tow down this little bit of narrows, set sail and sail up, pin me off from my daughter's wedding, and then to London to get another freight. That's all that happens. The, the River Orwell is certainly the most beautiful river on the East Coast. One of the most beautiful in England. They say the second most beautiful, the Dart and the Orwell. You've got no other river looks like this. Anywhere near as beautiful as this river. Anywhere on the East Coast, or the South Coast, I think. Because it's a famous old river, really. A lot of people have never seen it or heard of it. But there's big houses up here. Admirals lived in then, famous admirals. That's uh, Admiral Vernon's house. The Victor of Portobello, a man who invented grog for the Navy. I don't know whether he's popular in the Navy now. But in these cottages, you see, this is where the Admirals got the crews from. See, because everybody worked by the tide. I mean, the tide governs your life here. So if they wanted a good crew of men, you could always get one from the Orwell. In fact, even deep sea captains in Ipswich who are short of a crew, they say, well, nip down to Pin Mill, you'll always find somebody there. Because Pin Mill's just up here. That's been a village there for, oh, well, since Saxon times, since the Anglians came here, because this is East Anglia, you know, this is, this is England in real England, you know. The people in East Anglia call the place over there, that's the Shires over there, see, but this is England here. This is the home of the Anglians. This river was a lovely sight when everything was sail. Sailing ships used to be here, and I've come up this river with 47 barges, all turning the wind into a beautiful sight. Sailing fishing boats, and of course a few yachts, because all yachts now, but a few yachts to liven up the procedure, but what have you got now? You, you, all you've got is motor ships, container ships, and ships are getting uglier and uglier. They're flatter and flatter, and more and more slab-sided. I mean, you take this thing coming along here now, I don't know whether you can see her yet, but she looks like a piece of a factory broken adrift and going afloat down the river, doesn't she? Uh, well, you wouldn't call that a ship, would you? I don't know what you'd call it, really. She learned a lot of money and go for scrap, and who cares a damn? Yo! You get round her, it. If you laid alongside a ship like that, you'd catch something. Yeah, this was a great river for smugglers at one time. You know, they, they used to run cargoes from, mostly from Holland. The wages weren't much ashore. If it wasn't for the smuggling, all the people ashore would have starved. It's only the poachers and that came from alive. But uh, the smugglers used to come up here. Will Lord was a famous one, and John Luff was another. Condon was another. Will Law was a, the man concerned with the story of Margaret Catchpole, because this is always called Margaret Catchpole's River. In fact, there's people with yachts now the name of Margaret Catchpole. But uh, she worked for a priory farm up there for cobbles, and uh, Will Law was her lover. And he used to row ashore up Levington Creek there. She used to ride a horse down from Nacton and meet him. And, uh, Bring up about the pin mill, because that's where I live, pin mill, that little group of cottages over there, in the pub, in the hard. But uh, when they got up there, they could see the cat house, you see, which is in some way ahead, you can't quite see it now. But uh, they used to have a big cat, or a model of a cat, that they put in the window and uh, shine a light behind it. Well, if they saw the cat, then that was all clear to take the, the goods on up and land it up near Ipswich. 
see, and get the pony train off, rush me a, uh, rush me a piece. But if there was no cat in the window, they stopped at Pin Mill or stopped off Levington and waited until one of them went up in the boat to see what was wrong. That meant the excise men or the troopers were about. They used to say, no pussy, no sail. But uh, all the smugglers used to come up here in Stuart times because it was a safe river, plenty of good anchorages, plenty of rich merchants, plenty of rich parsons about, you know, to sell the wine did. I bet some of the communion services, you know, come from smuggled wine. But uh, down at Shockley there, they used to reckon they always hid the tubs in, in Shockley porch, you see. They had no steeple. So the excise set men said at one time that they, they no steeple there to hide anything in, so they built a bloody great porch, you see, and hid it in there. So the little rhyme always goes, and still well known around here, is Shotley Church without a steeple, drunken pass and wicked people. <laughs> but still, we always like to say there's no smuggling now. You've got to tell them that, ain't Yeah, there used to be a couple living in that cottage up there, just up above Hare's Creek. And uh, the old lady was just about dying, you know, going to bed for the last time. And she said, John, she said, don't you ever marry any other woman, he said. I've lived with you all this time. She said, if you do, she said, I'll scrabble up out my grave and come and haunt you. Well, anyway, John married another woman about a month after she died, see. So... Uh, I think it was Dick Young's father. Uh, said, what are you going to do about the old woman haunting you, John? Oh, he said, she won't haunt me. Said, How do you know? Well, she said she'd scrabble up out the grave and come and haunt me, so I buried her face down. The more she scrabbled, the deeper she'll go. <laughs> yes, hello, hello. But one thing, we caught the flood tied up the river because we've got to be up there for the wedding. The daughter's getting married. She might be the last one married in the old style, you know, at Pin Mill, because all the brides at Pin Mill have always walked across the path there and stepped over to Grindle before they've ever gotten a car or a coach, whatever they've had. And since all the houses now are half empty, you know, holiday makers' houses, maybe she'll be the last one. There'll be, there'll be some festivities in the back. There'll be singing and dancing in the old style. And, well, maybe the last one, maybe not. Yeah, easy the way the weather is. Ready, Bert. <laughs> Bound across the blue sea, goodbye, fare you well. We wish you well. We're honored bound to the old country. Goodbye, fare you well. We're honored bound. For oh, did not you hear the old man say, Goodbye, fare you well. We wish you well. We're homeward bound this very day. Goodbye, fare you well. We're homeward bound. So goodbye to Sally and goodbye to Sue. Goodbye, fare you well. We wish you well. And you Barry ladies, goodbye to you too. Goodbye, fare you well. We're home at bound. Well, I've always loved Pin Mill because uh, it's part of your life, you see, here. It's a barge village. I sailed with skippers from Pin Mill, been shipmates with Pin Mill men, sailed in Pin Mill barges. All the talk and the life of Pin Mill was barges. And there were always, in the old days, barges on the hard. Because we've got barges here now, but they're sort of restored old things. And uh, they're nothing to do with barging or the people in them. The sort of barge cult has grown up among amateurs, you know, like the wonderful old barges and all this old bull, see? They're not sailormen, they're not bargemen. 
Uh, they don't work for a living. It's a thing to have a barge and you sit on the hard there all the winter and you toddle around safe waters in the summer and uh, it's nice to see them on the hard. But if they let the sky for a living, you know, chasing from Pinmill to the Humber for coal and back to Margate and down to Southampton with timber and, you know, they, they, well, they've got no idea what it's all about. But you have to earn a living under sail to know what it's like. Have your bread and butter out of a sailing barge. Then you'll know what barging's like. It's just what these people don't realise. If some of the old skippers saw them the way they are now, they'd turn a somersault in their graves. Well, I don't know how many hundreds and thousands of sailormen have stepped on this hard and walked up there to the Button Oyster Inn for a pint because the Button Oyster's been there, well, they say at least since 1400. Uh, there used to be something like 30 fishing boats belong to Pin Mill, sort of in grandfather's time. And uh, they used to buy Dutch gin or little Dutch coasting boats, bring it back in their kit bags up the hard, and it was always a custom to hang your kit bag on the rail of the butt key. So there'd be a row, long, long row of kit bags hanging there, full of gin. The women used to come down with the grub while they were in the butt, take the gin out, fill them up with food. A few minutes later, instead of gin, the bags were full of food. So if the customers came along, then they'd see these full bags hanging there, well, that's the men's food. They'd never questioned that. So it was rather nice when they'd come into the butt, you see, and the old regiment would be sitting there, and they knew who it was. Little old eyes would sparkle. Oh, yeah. so, cold day. Have we dropped the gin? At one time, uh, Pinwheel was a hive of industry. But the industries we had here were pleasant industries. There was like the mill where Johnny Reed uh, worked, you know, up the hill there. I mean, a, a miller and a barge and a sailing ship and the river. I mean, all these things go together, don't they? All right, well, you want to say again? No, just come home. Yes, come home. Good <laughs> boy. That's all right. Most of the cottages along here have had the Orwell flow in the kitchen. I mean, the, the Orwell meant everything to us, but uh, of course it's still changing now. You see, all the little sailor men are gone. You've lost that type of person altogether. There aren't any now, there are none at all. They're finished. You can find plenty in the, alongside those tombstones up the road there. And of course a lot of them are down in the bottom of the sea. Colchester area and they're mostly country chaps from outside the town and uh, they sometimes pass the, the, uh, the membership or dancing parts on from father to son so it's a very very old traditional thing. <laughs> Young Jill, I mean, uh, she's bride now, but when she was a little tiny girl, she sailed in the barn, and she looked in the toy shop window of me one day, and she knew that I was weather-bound, and she said, if the wind comes northeast, can I have that teddy bear? She knows that I've got no money while the wind's south west, and she knew that much.
customer to invite all the villagers in on a wedding, and uh, we've tried to keep this up. But of course, the natives of the village have got fewer and fewer and fewer, so there are not all that number of people to invite. People like Ephraim and Bill Simpson. See, Bill was born in this cottage here. He's lived there all his life, and uh, I don't think it's his ambition to die, but I know he doesn't want to die anywhere else. One of the musicians was a young fellow, who I think he's a forester, dug up an old dulcimer, prepared it, learned how to play it. Another one is an Irish skipper. One of them is an antique dealer. So they're um, just a bunch of local people, really. They're not a class band. They do this for amusement. traditions of Pinmill is that when we had all the natives here, we all used to muck in and help each other. But Bill Simpson, he's a good chap for the weather, so he from come to that. Suppose I was away at sea, they'd come and knock them up, say there's a northwest wind, there's a big tide, we'll be round if it gets any worse. And you knew if you weren't here that they'd come in, because we never locked our doors, you see. They'd come in, they'd shift all the furniture, pick up the carpet, shove them all up out the way upstairs. You can't organise people like that, they just do it. I mean, one of the big floods, there used to be a chap live over in that wooden cottage there, and in those days they always kept a pig. And uh, there were a big tide, northwest wind, spring tide, and his father had died. And the uh, local shipwright used to make the coffins in. So he got the old fella in the coffin, and uh, there he was on the table, you see, in the front room. But the old pig down the garden, he's getting a bit deep, and you know, pigs die of shock. So he got the pig up in the house. Well, the water kept rising and rising until eventually, I mean, the, the pig's up with his belly and on the floor. Because the old fella in the coffin, he's all right, he's on the table. So uh, <laughs> he looked at him, he thought, himself, well, the old fella's gone. I mustn't lose the pig. So finish up, he. He took father off the table, put him down in the water, put the pig on the table, and this father's sculling around and around the front room, and the pig's all right. And he said that was a good cop, and he said, because our fella never made a drop of water. <laughs> Peter is an Essexman. He comes from the Colchester area. Although he's related, I think, to a fishing family from Harwich. And he and Jill will live in Essex in Malden. They've got a little old timber house there. It's a Morris dancer ever since he was a boy. He's a member of the team, that's why they were there. He's from, he from Charm, of course, he's a, a local man, local character. Well, he's mayor of Penn Mill, isn't he? I mean, uh, he fires the gun, you see, when the couple go off. This has always been done. We've always had a gun for all the little celebrations we have here. I think Pinmill without Ephraim just wouldn't be Pinmill. Last time, I wonder where 
my seafood sweat. <laughs> When we first came here, there were quite a lot of families, but now they've gone. And the children have grown up and gone away. And um, as the cottages have become vacant, they've um, been taken by yachtsmen and uh, people from away. Take yesterday's wedding, Bob, with, uh, with old Ephraim who found a gun and, and, and Bill singing his bargeman's alphabet. I mean, when these people have gone, who will there be left to, to well, keep the uh, traditions alive? When all the old villages are gone, uh, and their houses are taken over the weekend, the whole place would be dead, wouldn't it? Eh? You take these cottages here, down the end there. Well, my old skipper lived in one, his brother in the other, wasn't there? Yeah. Uh, Bill Simpson, he's bred and born in that cottage, he's still there. But he's the only survivor, because the others are weekenders. This one's empty, bought by a weekender, then there's us. Mm. But then there was a doctor who lived there, wasn't there? Yes. Dad yeah. borrows the barge, when yeah. he's dead, he was in the next one. And all those up the top there, I mean, they're, they're just tombstones, aren't they, in the week? Mm -hmm. You yes, might as well be in a graveyard, though. there's nobody there. Yeah. Well, my family has milled in, in the village, as you know, for several generations. The mill is no longer working, it's, it's derelict, and I'm afraid um, there's this sort of feeling about Pin Mill now. It's, uh, it's, it's changing, and it's become a weekend attraction. We get hordes of visitors at that yes, weekend, yes, and it's a ghost, yes. ghost hamlet through the week. Well, it's, it's ten, ten, tended to become a DOS house and car park now, isn't it, really? <laughs> <laughs> All these people come, they say, what a lovely little place to live in, and start to ruin it right away. Yeah. Of building those monstrosities up there, you know. Mm. It could be the back of St Albans, could not it, now? The only mm. bit of the village left is this little bit, and the best thing we can do is build a bloody great wall all around here and keep them out. <laughs> isn't it? That's quite true. Yeah. But you take that seat down there, John. Mm. We all chuck the pennies in, tanners, yeah. to make a seat to remember old Bill yeah. Watts, for the yeah. old fellas to sit on and look out over the river. But what have they got to look out on? A lot of exhausts and cars. And every time one starts up, blow the exhaust in the old fellas' faces, yeah. well, nobody sits on it. Mm. And the talk in the butt noise is not about ships now, it's all about yachts and pink gins, isn't it? Different thing altogether. It's become a yacht in place more than anything else. There have been a lot of attempts here to ruin Pinmill. You know, speculators have come in and tried to more or less destroy the place as a hamlet. You know, make it in a holiday camp and all this sort of rubbish. And, I mean, we've no money or influence or anything, but we did form a little preservation society to try and stop it all. But we've only been partly successful. We were rather late, you see. I mean, a lot of these things are done over your head. But we tried to preserve Pin Mill, and now there's a move afoot to try and preserve the barge. Drew. We've kept the Cambria going as a trading vessel and nothing else. Um, I don't want her to be a yacht and carrying holiday makers around and that sort of thing. I mean, she was built as a barge to carry cargo and she'll finish as a barge carrying cargo. And we are the last one under sail in England and I believe in, in Europe. But we'll keep her going as long as ever we can. <laughs>